All right. Today we have a guest that we've had on before for, if you guys remember, the stablecoin debate, Christian Kamer. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the Divi Crypto Podcast. Always a pleasure. So I really appreciate you coming back because last time we talked, we talked a little bit about something that I think is going to be one of the most pivotal, pivotal moments as far as digital currency is concerned, which are CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. And you've become somewhat of an expert on this topic, right? Well, somewhat out of necessity because um, it's almost self-explaining that if and when the central banks decide to create a new form of payment mechanism, it's going to have a huge influence on the topic that we are interested in investing, the topic of value transfer overall. So it behooves us obviously to be part of those discussions and where we can help out since we probably have done more research in that space than all countries combined at this point in time. So for the past three years, we've been solely focused on value transfer technology. So we spent probably about 35,000 hours at this point. Um, and the way we go about this is um, we're employing the scientific method as, as much as possible, right? And go at it from first principles. I think that's a prudent approach whenever you have specifically things like a paradigm shift. And that's kind of how um, we like to see this particular technology. And so you see, good. Yeah. yeah. So, so from that perspective, um, we put out quite a bit of content and um, have the benefit of having this basically peer reviewed ten thousand times at this point in time, and six hundred of these peer reviews were very very detailed because that's essentially our due diligence process when we engage with a team that has a solution to the topic of value transfer, and so we have done this hundreds of times. And so when I when I look at um, the papers that are being circulated around the, top, the topic of CBDCs, uh, there seems to be um, quite a bit of lack of this just fundamental research in terms of what is the state of different value transfer systems right now and then also um, what's the state of development within the space at large, right? And to me, that's that's the fundamental first step, like I always explain. So if you want to go to Paris, right, um, the, the first thing that you do is you don't buy an airplane ticket. The first thing that you need to do is establish where you are. Otherwise, you will never get to Paris. Right. <laughs> right. And so that, that's something that I see every day. And a lot of these papers that I read um, suggest to me that they, they bought the ticket first, but they have not established where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on, on their way to some place, but uh, if they ever get there, it seems questionable. Right. So when you say there's significant lag, do you think that's just uh, you know a result of government bureaucracy or the federations that are creating these currencies aren't doing enough research? Uh, I mean, it's probably a combination of a number of things. I, I think there's not enough resources that are being assigned to that topic. It's a very complex topic. I mean, as I said, we spent the last three years on that and quite a bit of resources. So we have a team of six here, mostly data scientists. And then we have the benefit of essentially reaching out to startups in the field that also do research. Right? So to the extent that we actually now started to reach back for some time to academia and our politicians to offer our help, because what we see on our end then coming out of university and so forth is a lack of education and um, not the type of people that we need uh, that either we want to employ and or um, that startups that we support in the space um, want to employ, right? Because they just don't have um, the necessary occasion to understand where this is going. And um, I, I think one of my pet peeves is uh, in, in that particular space, and that's a slide that I've seen, I don't know, dozens of times at least, maybe a hundred times or more, is um, there will be a slide with the team and then there, there will be one or more people on there that have a particular background, usually in, let's call it financial services. But the problem with that is, and that, that, that's meant to convey credibility and so forth, right? And, but uh, the problem with that is though that um, if you have a paradigm shift like the one um, we see with blockchain-based solutions or decentralized software solutions in general, then 
uh, it's almost like going from a horse to a car, right? So in terms of, well, you might have hired the best jockey, but um, we were looking for a race driver. And, and so your jockey, who has been a banker for 10 years, wasn't really exposed to, to these type of development and probably worse, he's been indoctrinated into a certain type of thinking. And we typically say, well, you don't have, uh, there's no such thing as 20 years of banking experience. You have 20 times one year experience because you have 20, you've, all, you've done the same thing over and over and over again because that industry hasn't changed much. Right? I mean, there's right. so, so many things um, that you can do with uh, quote unquote money. And I, I think we're going to uh, go into this in some granularity, which is really required. Yeah. So that's interesting. You know, you're right. That's, that's such a good point. You know, I, I see that a lot too. You know, oh, we brought this person over from the banking world. That means we have all of the necessary required resources to implement this brand new thing. Now, this brand new thing is being implemented in many different ways. Now, being that you've researched it so much, are any implementations viable yet? I mean, are we looking at blockchain? Are we looking at traditional databases? Like, how is this actually going to come into effect? Oh, so um, uh, let me suggest something. So um, as I mentioned, we, we employ the scientific method and as a VC, we do doing due diligence um, on these things. So we have a, a certain procedure we go through, right? And we're right. just pretty straightforward. And if you employ that, I think it's going to be useful regardless if you want to invest into a company or build a solution. So. The, the first fir first thing is always just to, to start with your definition. So I, mean, I think we, we talked about this in, in the last podcast a little bit, but it's always worth repeating in my opinion. It's like as a startup, you want to uh, first define what's, what's your problem, right? What, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Well, it sounds simple enough, but um, uh, I don't think that most people identify the correct problem. For the most part. <laughs> a lot of times like they identify the, the the banks for example as the problem well the banks solve a problem so you got to kind of look behind the curtains and see okay well what banks are what, what what are the problems that the banks are addressing right and so if you then go back in history and that's unfortunately also a little bit of a, a, another challenge here is that we see with people that have been indoctrinated in certain type of um, thinking and definitions coming out of business school and we touched on that last time is that there's still this old and um, definition of money that has always been in my opinion misguided as in money is a unit of account medium of exchange and the store of value um, that actually throughout history has hardly ever been true so what Javon's and I have his book right here is really a booklet but uh, what he is really referring to there is is not the functions uh, of money. He's uh, of referring to the functions of a particular type of money, which is mm. kind of commodity money, which had almost no relevance throughout history ever. I mean, people always refer to the idea of having gold coins and so forth, but throughout history that hasn't really hold hold true. Right? Well, like Homo sapiens have been around for like three, five hundred thousand years, and um, we only started settling down 10,000 years ago. And before that, there was definitely no need and would have been very cumbersome to, to carry any gold coins around. They, they weren't around. They wouldn't have been very practical and humans were living in small tribes. The point there being as exchange of um, commercial activity, if you will, was done via, let's call it social contracts. That is, has been and today still is the default method. So that was factually true throughout 98% of human history. So even then, after we started settling down 10,000 years ago, for the most part, people were toiling in the fields for a very long time, right? So I think people need to put this into perspective because it's very important to see the indoctrination into certain um, systems and uh, at, the, at the same point in time, then ignore fundamentals. So the point here being, so the Industrial Revolution, which is set in about uh, mid-1800s, um, is probably the starting point when we can look back and compare things with what we call quote-unquote money today. But again, still, even throughout that very, very tiny history, which is like less than... Uh, 
one hundredth of a percent of, of human history. Uh, within that history, we hardly ever had commodity money in circulation. Right? Mm. It was always something else. And that something else, well, we, we should just briefly break, break, uh, break down again, because um, what Javons was referring to after like talking about Bada a lot, Bada was never at any particular point a relevant um, mechanism to facilitate commercial activity. Right? That, that is just a myth. Um, so oftentimes people confuse that and say, well, it solved the Bada problem. No, 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 no that, that, it, it did not. But uh, regardless of that, that idea, so the, the first thing is that, that the, the function right, that money really solves is, is simply language, it's simply the quantification of ones. And I'm, I'm, I'm making a, pr a parable for that. I'm going to write it out because that makes it much easier for people to comprehend than like fancy words. If, if you have a coconut vendor and you have three people standing in front of him and the first coconut wanna, wanna be buyer looks at the coconut and thinks, oh, Oh, I'm willing to pay five five US dollars for that. And the second person looks at the same coconut and is like, ah, I think it's about worth four euros. And then the third person is looking at the same coconut and he's like, oh, I think I could give him probably 30 pesos. So the coconut obviously didn't change, but what it tells you, it's just the particular language the person got indoctrinated on that he uh, or she understands value in. So it's a particular right. language of value. So once then they communicate with the potential seller, they, they realize, oh, the, the seller has his own language of value. The, the, the seller wants Simonis, which is the currency of Kajikistan. And uh, he tells them well, it's X, Y, Z, Simonis. And so what do they have to do? Well, the, now they have to translate, right? So they have to translate his language of value into their language of value. And then the next step after that is, okay, uh, will you accept my five dollars? Right? Then you have to decide, okay, do I want this particular um, language, this particular medium of exchange? And right. so that's really the starting point. And everybody steps over the first couple of starting points, but those are the two main use cases, of, uh, the, the two main functions of money. It's simply that of language, and then secondarily, is that of agreement. Every, every money, as soon as you introduce a second party, is simply an agreement. That's all there is. If between you and I, we decide Pokemons are money, Pokemons are money, right? And I mean, you can see this all around the world and in different situations. And that's why um, mackerels of, um, the pouches of mackerels can be money in prison, right? Right. Uh, uh, some people will, will know the story about that. But so, once you actually get to like solving this coincidence of one's problem, right? So, so you, you realize the, the primary function of money then becomes spending, right? So all spent money. But uh, over the past uh, like 260 years approximately, there has been a very important secondary function that actually facilitates more, uh, most of commercial activity, which is that of lending. And typically lending for spending. So when if the, you call the first problem the coincidence of one's problem, like the COW or cow problem, you could call the, the second problem the cow now problem, right? So I, I want to buy something now, so I need to borrow that money. <laughs> and so the, the, the larger point here being though, to, to divvy that out, if you will, <laughs> is uh, that you need to realize uh, that there's functions and there's use cases and people conflate the two when when you do that you're already lost because language is the most important tool that's the most important technology we develop and if you're unclear about your language right and you start building something the chances that you build the right tool with that misguided wording is pretty pretty slim and mm -hmm. that's something that's a consistent theme and that's why I usually look for definitions in, in white papers and so forth. Whenever they're missing, it's a big red flag. You should sit down and really be clear about the words that you're introducing, specifically in, in our case, and when we're looking at new technologies that would, uh, in and of themselves bring kind of new, term, uh, new techno terminologies with them. Right? That's the most important tool you need to use. It's not about 
blockchain. It's not about databases, not about bytes. It's about you understanding the language. And then you need to translate this into the appropriate code. But before you haven't really made yourself clear about what you're trying to translate, what's, what's the point of starting to code anything, right? Anyway, that was a long, long cumbersome kind of deviation of like starting out with the problem statement. But as I said, if you don't do that, it's it's a problem. <laughs> Great problems <laughs> along the line. <laughs> well, I agree 100 percent because the the introduction and eventual implementation of this particular technology, CBDCs, will have an impact that's incredibly long lasting. Right. Just like. Yeah traditional money has. So I think it's I think it's definitely relevant to take it all the way back from the source of what money is actually for. I think that's actually Yeah, and so I, I read many of the current um, proposals for the, within the CBDC space and then also it's important to understand that they are in, in essence a, a subset of stable coins and which themselves are now a subset of value transfer overall and all of which obviously influence each other, right? They they don't do not stand in isolation. And the other important thing to realize is that money is um, mostly reliant on network effects, right? If, if you had all the money in the world, you wouldn't have any value because no one else had it. It would have no utility <laughs> right. for anybody else. You had all the money in the world, and by definition, it would actually be worth nothing, right? So mm -hmm. money really doesn't have any value outside of its utility, right? outside of how many other people want to use it. And this, this comes back to, okay, how many other people are using it? How, how many other people are using, in this particular case, remember money being language, this particular language? So from that perspective, you can look at the landscape of money in terms of market sizes right now. So the, the market leader worldwide by a large margin is the US dollar. 62% of all money in the, in the world is, dom uh, value, is denominated in US dollar, then uh, euro being the distant second uh, with about 20% and then yen has a small portion of the world is about 5% and then you got um, the British pound sterling which is about 4.5% and all the other things and even renminbi don't really matter, right? And so the point there being, it's important to realize money lives mostly of its network effects. If most people use this particular language, just like if you look at the World Wide Web, most, most pages are in English, right? So, and right. even if I'm in Germany, if I'm in Japan, I, there's a good chance that I consume a lot of content that's, that's written in English. And I'm a big like, proponent of we should just have one world language and be done with it. I think that would go a long way for, to, to world peace and so forth. But in the context of market dominance, um, so you're in, you're in essence, if you're creating a new unit of account and or you're creating a new feature for your existing unit of account, you, you should realize that that's the first thing you, you're competing with, hmm. right? So that, that's, right. that's the brand that you're competing with, right? It's like, just like you're putting out a new computer and you call it something, well, there's other computers out there and you compete with their functions, you also compete with their brand. Itself, right? So, so right. an Apple computer might be an inferior device to most PCs, but people like the brand and they're willing to pay for the brand and they go for the brand that's trusted, right? And trust is a super important, uh, the, the next very important aspect if it comes to quote unquote money in this particular sense, right? That's right. Yeah. And a lot of people, I think, especially right now, some people are losing confidence in certain currencies, right? the dollar included. And you see the markets fluctuating as a result of that. But yet the US dollar is still the world's reserve currency. Do you see, and this is kind of off of the fundamental topic, but do you see other CBDCs becoming more uh, relevant as far as a world, worldwide transfer of exchange? Like could a digital yuan flip the dollar? No, the, the chances are slim to none. And, but this also um, re refers to the fact that the functions of money have split a long time ago. So uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, what we're talking about here is technology, right? So um, w what label you put on that technology at the end of the day is really up to the developer, right? Yeah, and for all intents and purposes, you could show, show me the value of Bitcoin and Pokemon. 
not. But I just like to happen to like to see it in US dollars because that's what I understand the most, and that's what most merchants around me tend to accept for for daily purchases. So that's simply more convenient. So I default to that. Right. Um, so, but uh, I, I think what we, we should do is just put maybe some quantification to that. So because. Um, what most of these papers zero in on, and it's it's not wrong to do this, but it's at the same point in time also somewhat myopic, as they 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 focus on the payment function of money, which is which is fine as it goes. Uh, then, but what you then need to do again comes down to my travel example. You need to establish how people are paying right now. Right? So, uh, if you take the SS example, so you about have about a hundred. 74 billion transactions a year and uh, the value in, in these uh, 174 billion transactions is about just under, under 100 trillion and so you want to parcel out how these are being done right now so most of that is debit cards uh, which is about 40 percent and then uh, 42 or something and then then um it's credit and i'll go back to credit um, that's how quote unquote payment is done. It's, it, it's important to understand some nuances about credit cards, specifically or credit. Uh, cash is still a large portion in terms of number of transactions, very surprisingly, is above 20 percent. And the, the last number I have is in 2018. So it, it's really very surprising, right? That, that in 2018, still 24 percent of every transaction in the United States. So. A lot of people, just from their like own experience, drawing from anecdotes, if they pay on a daily basis only with debit cards, and if you're a millennial, you might never actually carry cash anymore, right? But when there's actually, um, at least, I think it's around 10% of people who simply live in a cash-based society in the US, who, who simply don't have any of those means, and which is a good part of the motivation of creating, um, at least according to the those particular papers, um, these new instruments called CBDCs. So then there's also still 2% uh, of people writing checks, which I had never <laughs> seen a check before I moved to the United States 20 years ago um, in my 30 years being back in, in Europe. So that was a very odd thing to see, but okay, I'm sure it is sure. what it is. I, uh, you need to establish that. So maybe moving backwards to credit, and that's going to become important later. So credit is significantly different from, from debit and, and cash and checks. So if you look at large money um, qualifications, so you, the, the way the Federal Reserve does it now and uh, will be important still for a little while, probably is. So there's your M0, which is your physical cash, that's your coins and your Federal Reserve notes, and we can talk more about those. And then you got your M1, which includes that, but then also like uh, cash equivalents. It's, let's call it your checking accounts is an M1. Then. And so those you can draw from using your, your debit card and um, you can use it to take out cash, right? And you can write checks on it. So that's that part. So credit is very very different and the reason why well is this is important to understand it's it's a function of the individual um, a lot of times we we'll, we'll commit these semantic violations and saying the bank is giving you credit no credit is something that you have the bank mm -hmm. doesn't give you credit the bank lends you money again it comes down to you what in this particular paradigm you want to be very very accurate with your language you're building technology, right? And the first technology is your language. If, if you already don't know the, the difference of when it's lending and when it's credit, then the following will happen. So there are certain functions and, and certain, uh, let's, I call them slots, uh, uh, facilities you need to implement into your client technology, some of, uh, and some of which you need to build into your server technology. And that's probably the, the, one of the largest blind spots I, uh, I, that we've noticed across those papers, they don't differentiate much. What I mean by that is like a, a token, if you create a, a new CBDC as a token, for example, right? Right. right. Obviously, you, you as an individual can only do something if you have a, a necessary software instrument that you can use to manipulate that. Let's call it wallet right. for that matter, right? So, so then you need to check, okay, what, what are the facilities of the wallet? 
And so if you want to stick with uh, what we've seen a lot of um, those papers with the mandate that it should be um, the equivalent of digital cash, which I really hope to see, but, but well, I'm very, very skeptical if we see this um, intentionally. <laughs> and my expectation is we see the unintentional <laughs> development of peer-to-peer -peer cash. Um, but so if you're really, if you're really serious about that, right, then, well, th there is then no KYC. There's no personal identifiable data attached and shouldn't be attached to that wallet, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, because if I, if I give you $100, you don't have to know who I am. Right, right. that's and cash. Exactly. And so obviously there's a whole another chain of um, problems attached to that um, that relate to the particular implementation of let's call it a blockchain-based solution, decentralized software solution or whatever, which mm -hmm. has to do with the fact that even uh, if your transaction ha didn't have personal identifiable data attached to it, if at any point in time um, there was kind of a custodial relationship to that particular asset, it becomes semi-trivial to then follow that path. So, and that's why we mm -hmm. have all these, what I would call nefarious actors in, in the space that kind of facilitate uh, the, t the chain analysis of who is doing what, which uh, in many ways obviously um, conflicts with what I call the herd immunity of right. the underlying network. And we simply, from that perspective, and then we're going to stop diving down this particular area at all, need to um, implement, let's call it anonymity on the layer one and on layer zero level, which also kind of indicates that blockchains may actually not be the right solution, it might be DAX, it might be right. uh, yeah, it might be graph-based solutions. Anyway, so maybe we'll move back to just breaking this down. So essentially, if you look at a due diligence framework, so we started out with our problem statement, right? What, what, what's the actual problem? Not, not, it's not a technology problem, what, what is the human problem? And also identified, well, it's, it's, it's not the bank that are the problem, the bank solve a problem. You just want to be solving the problem better, right? And so now what we, in a way, talked about was the market size, because as a VC, the way we look at this, so what market are you addressing? And then um, you start out with the market size and then you define the addressable market. And what I mean by that is, so all of those transactions I mentioned earlier, your debit cards, your, your cash transaction, your check transaction. So they all have typically friction attached. That that friction is usually quantified in, in time delays and in fees and in other inconveniences, like having to fill out forms when you're sending more than ten thousand dollars and and other erroneous ideas that um, regulators have introduced over the years, right? Which frankly shouldn't exist, but um, that's neither here nor there. I'm, I'm a technologist at heart, so I, I think technology will, will, will solve for the problems that regulation introduces at the end of the day. <laughs> I so, hope so. So, but, um, so to get to your total addressable market, and that's what we do all day long, and that's what I request from every entrepreneur in that space, what you need to identify. So identify the friction. Right? So what are the time delays? What are the fees attached to that? And parcel that out. So because if you're introducing something new and if you expect market adoption, which we're getting to, you, you need to typically, in, from where we're standing, deliver three things. You, you need to be usually um, cheaper, faster, and then better in some form. And right. we, can, we can break out better. But... Uh, faster is relatively easy, right? So settlement for ACH transactions takes 90 days <laughs> when it's actually settled. So a lot of times that's the other thing that I seem to anecdotally have noticed across those papers that um, uh, the, the authors a lot of times use payment and settlement synonymous. And needless to say, you, you cannot do this if you're building like small mm -hmm. bits within that space. This is an, an enormous difference. So you, you want to be very, very accurate about what is payment because payment for, for most people, they experience this as an instant thing, right? So payment right. In, in their uh, mind is not a problem. Again, you, if you want to solve a problem, it needs to be a problem to the human. It's don't have, if you're so, just solving a technical problem, well, you didn't address in your market, right? And so the point here being is, uh, who's your client, right? 
um, but which goes then down to who, who are we actually addressing. So what's the addressable market within that? So what other, what, how can you better it be better? It's like, uh, how can your technology be better, but then actually solve a human problem? So either in terms of analytics or quote unquote programmable money, which is a term that's been thrown around a lot, which I think um, that part has kind of already mostly solved beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I think there's this gap between what technologists are doing right now and what policy makers are doing and trying to move this forward. And they're coming at this from different angles, which is, which is totally fine. It's just important that both parties realize where, where they are. So, but, so that, that we talked about mostly right now of the, for the, about the payment function. And remember, I mean, the, the, two use cases for, for money is spending and lending. That's it. You can break it down from there. And by the way, it's important again to understand. So the, the function of money is language. The, the use case is spending lending. So, um, and the, the way to remember that, for example, is here. So the, the function of a hammer is to centralize the center Vehicle force, right? And then the use case is typically you put a nail in the wall. <laughs> right. you, you can, right? So that, that's how you differentiate function and use cases, which Javons didn't manage to do. He, he created this kind of misguided definition that everybody is using. Hmm. Um, you also obviously can do other things with a hammer, as in like harm another life. Um, I don't recommend it, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is we kind of defaulted to this idea of, well, you can do harm with money, quote unquote, you can do nefarious things with money. So we need to deputize financial service providers to then spy on you proactively. As in you're buying a hammer, I assume you want to hit someone in the head. No, I, <laughs> I, 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 no, I assume you want to put a nail in the wall. That would be the right assumption, right? Right. Anyway, um, that, that's something that, uh, I used to be a lawyer a long time ago, and to, to me, it's always very surprising that people don't push back against these these obvious misguided ideas and overwhelming introduction of deputization of private companies for what should be public functions, which that's another part to realize. And that's, I think, what every paper that I read seemed to have identified money as far as money being created um, by governments or, or central banks is a sort of a public good, a public function, right? And from that aspect, we should have fixed that public function a long time ago. Think about it in these terms. So there's 10% of the U.S. population, not, not let alone to talk about other countries, that cannot get a bank account, right? So that that's, that's like 10% if you want to look at the public function component of money, 10% of people not being able to get on the freeway. Yeah. They just have to use country roads. Because, right. well, of, of for whatever. somebody. <laughs> I I yeah, it's not, I don't know why, but for whatever reason. And w we have done little to, to fix that. And uh, I'm concerned that even with the, the current movements within that direction, a, um, there's no expectations as far as I can tell that anybody on from the public sector is going to introduce a viable solution within the next three to five years. By, by then, the topic has largely moved on, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so moving this back. So what we're talking about now is let's talk about the product itself. So we already obviously have a lot of stable coins, right? So we're, and people try to come up with different classifications and that's that's la largely somewhat of a fruitless exercise so, uh, we have algorithmic stable coins right and th they have certain um functions quote unquote and then we have packs and i, I think most people who, who will listen to this particular podcast will realize well usdt tether is the most used stable coin and it's really a pack and uh, the, the use case is really that of speculating on centralized exchanges. That's it. Right? Right. No one's going out and using Tether to pay for 
the milk and the option. <laughs> no, it's a way to stay in crypto while right. you're trading. So, yeah, so the, the point that being is uh, it's not used for spending. So it's, it's just a particular use case within a very insulated space. So uh, to call that a competitor is probably n n not really fair. But um, the other point there is um, that a lot of these quote unquote functions will probably be functions not of the, the token. And you know what I typically say, the number of cryptocurrencies we need is anywhere between zero and one. It's just a lot of people that don't understand the current value transfer system mechanics, right? And so th those functions you want to build into um, your client software at the end of the day, right? So all the function will, will obviously, in my opinion, live there. So anyhow, so we haven't talked much about the, the actual main use case of money today, which is lending, right? So, right. and they are, the, the way I like to look at the overall topic of money is in these broad buckets. And they are also hardly understood, it seems, and also not, not mentioned at all in those papers. It's like, who gets to create money today? is one big part and it's actually mostly the commercial banks i think we touched on it before the commercial commercial banks create money via lending this is money from nothing right so this is um money that hasn't existed um and yeah that's also the money that's causing inflation but uh, maybe we, we don't bring this particular topic up in this discussion but i think it's very important to to understand that A, who gets to create money, then uh, who gets to store money, who gets to move money, and then also who gets to remove money, right? Mm -hmm. So right now you wanna identify, okay, who are these actors right now? So who gets to create money? Mostly commercial banks, then uh, the Federal Reserve gets to create a little bit of that. Who gets to store money? Well, the, the digital form of money that, and again, the default medium of exchange has been bytes for decades. Uh, please stop saying stuff like Bitcoin is a medium of exchange, it's not, it's, <laughs> it's also bytes. Um, so who gets to store those particular bytes? Well, right now you need to have certain licenses and most of, of these um, rely, rely with banks. And so they store this type of digital money they create it in, in this form as well. So they create it into mortgages. And then, the, so this is one form of lending and that's the largest form of lending. This is, let me look at my numbers here. So this is about 36% of the total money supply right now. Is mortgages. That is mortgages. So if you wow. look at, at overall money and it might be a little unfair the way I'm doing this, I'm rethinking this at the moment, but, um, it, it it seems to me making intuitive sense. I'll publish it at some point in time for for wider discussion. But right now, the way I look at this, so thirty six percent of the money that's out there right now in our economy in the United States is has been created for mortgages, and that is the largest source inf of inflation. And the main inflation there is the inflation of the asset, and then the secondary inflation is the inflation to the to the base, and so. In terms of purchasing power, unfortunately, that's not being uh, put into the metrics. But if you put it into the metrics, then the actual inflation year over year is above 12%. Right. Anyway, so then the, the second largest bucket, which is maybe surprising, a certificate of deposits. And that's where I expect a lot of movement because that's about, really, yeah, because that, that's about 29% uh, uh, based on the latest number that I looked at. So a third almost a third of money out there, right? And there it's kind of split between this has been either created by commercial banks or the Federal Reserve, um, but that's also lending. It's just uh, lending by misguided consumers to banks. And yeah, misguided yeah. because right now you, 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 your um, interest rate is below the inflation rate. Yeah, you're losing money just by holding it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, not, not really a prudent exercise. And if you're in the DeFi markets, obviously you can do much more. But unfortunately, for most people, the DeFi markets are kind of a mystery at the moment. So right. we, don't, we won't be talking about that. So then uh, about 23% um, of current money supply 
is based on corporate debt. I need to kind of break this down because I'm unclear how much of that is new money, how much is of that is existing money and how much does it add to inflation. Anecdotally, I've seen some articles that attribute um, a lot of that to new money creation and then to the inflation of the stock market specifically. But anyway, so then you got larger buckets like student loans and auto loans, but then um, maybe back to credit cards. Credit cards is a, it's a large bucket, but again, it's important to understand credit is a function of the individual. Right? So it, it's not part of the money supply. Anyway, so the, the point of this exercise is if, if you're addressing a, a new form of money movement, um, ideally, at least in my mind, you want to go at it from first principles. So as in, well, if you're creating the, this new, new, new unit um, and it moves in certain ways, well, I think it would be very useful to implement a way of tracking this, right? As in, right. As it, it's not too, too easy right now to see what was money being created for, who created it and so forth. I think there's a lot of value to be had if that was transparent and if it was transparent to everybody. Because again, it comes back to money being a public good. Shouldn't we all know who creates money at any given point in time? Should we all be able to well, use a block explorer and see, oh, there's new money and who created it for and uh, what was it created for? So we can have more honest debates about, okay, well, what is actually a useful reason to create new money and have my own opinions on that that don't really matter but uh for me it's about like the starting point is quantifying and qualifying these and the only way of doing this is introduce a technology at the inception of new money so that's kind of the final point and um so i actually put forth very very specific ideas uh to various teams around the world that move that, that are working on these CBDC ideas for a nomenclature, as in who created it, for what reason, and what are the useful things to track. Not, again, not, not for the purpose of nailing down the individual person and or entity, but for the purpose of getting kind of instant macroeconomic data that is tied to the creation and movement of money. So, and then, we already talked about who gets to move quote unquote money right and how that's being done right now again for the consumer a lot of times it's it's not a problem so who these solutions might mostly address is in that case businesses but then the first business is probably being the banks themselves right? as in right. it's usually this falls into the bucket of quote unquote wholesale cbdc right? because uh, right now, the, the, uh, one of the main reasons that, that uh, if I send you $10 from my bank account, you're banking at a different bank, that this $10, $10 seems to disappear for 24 hours. Is yeah. that, that they're using different technologies and have to reconcile overnight. So even if you're using a newer technologies like the Zells of the world, etc., those are just agreements. So this is, has nothing to do with, with technology. These are just agreements that simulate in instant settlement. They aren't instant settlement, actually. It's pretty much anyway, the same so, thing is going on in the background, like when you use a Zelle or, or yeah. similar technology. Co it's just like an optimistic way of <laughs> yes. showing the consumer that the money's yeah. gone. So, yeah. And so, um, so all, I mean, what, what we talked about for the most part here is like identify what, what is the different market sizes, right? So, and the, the one part here is what is the friction right now that you're addressing what is the opportunity right if you were to introduce um, a commercial solution if you're not uh, introducing a cbdc and i think um, cbdc's then can take their lessons from there and, and right now we ha don't have great lessons right but a lot of that has to do with the, those on and what i call the on and off ramps being still laid with friction right? the interaction of the legacy financial system so that's why it's, it's always so queer to me when, when people refer to uh, things like PayPal and so forth as fintech. There's nothing fintech about that. It's window dressing. It's, it's, I mean, they're still interacting with the, um, with the legacy financial systems. Like the first fintech we had uh, are blockchain-based solutions. And we, we still don't have peer-to-peer -peer digital cash, obviously. Yeah. Right. So, so if and when 
you, you have done your homework, you identified your market sizes, your competitor and so forth, then we'll finally get to some form of technical due diligence. This is typically where these papers tend to start. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times it's like oh here are these like five things in payment that we want to address and this is how we think we can address them mm -hmm. but they forgot to say <laughs> this is why <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so yeah. Uh, well and so then we, we eventually getting then to the go go to market strategy right we, we talked sure, a lot sure. about who are the actual people that have a problem right now so there's um in broad strokes two kinds Right. So there's the people that actually don't have access to commercial banking accounts for whatever reason it might be. And then there's merchants who uh, have to live with whatever commercial dictates that a commercial bank dictates them in terms of fees and, and other erroneous ideas that the, the bank might want to introduce into that exchange that you and I have when we exchange value, right? which th that seems very odd in a way right specifically if you consider this as a public good but why if we have a private interaction commercially what why do we have to necessarily turn to something that's government created and inflationary which comes down to one particular important like prediction maybe so we, we talked about those those different classes of money with m0 being cash like physical cash and one being your, your checking account i expect those two classes to go up in velocity, as in the number of times they turn over. And an interesting indicator, it doesn't like compare all that well, but um, it was the early example of tether. Tether's velocity, the, the number of times one tether turns over in a given day might be, I forgot let's say four or five times. So the entire market cap of Tether, like, like if the market cap is, I forgot what it is, what is it right now, 10 billion, right? Then you will see that the velocity is like 48 billion. So it's like 4.8 in, in velocity, which um, 4.8 is about the velocity of a US dollar in a quarter. <laughs> so, the point here being is, so yeah, you got very efficient, albeit mostly these are centralized systems, obviously, where they're being used right now, but there, there's no reason that they have to be centralized systems, right? And they should be a decentralized systems. So one thing that seems to be uh, almost self-explaining that um, every fiat is inflationary, some, some more, some less, and a lot of the, the actual numbers are sort of propaganda, but it doesn't really matter. The, the point being is you don't want to hold on to anything that's inflationary, right? For longer than, than you need to. And the usual example when I talk about that topic is you already don't keep a million dollars in your checking account or any like, like larger amounts that you personally don't expect to spend within the foreseeable future. So what if your wallet would just allocate this usefully at any given yeah. time and you could instantly then, if someone wants payment in, in fiat, swap into that fiat. So how much of M1 would you hold at any given point in time? The, the answer is zero, right? The velocity yeah, will come yeah. up, but there wouldn't actually be any money in there. So right now, if you have money in your checking account, the bank gets to use that. And remember I told you earlier, that CDs is the second largest group of lending, but that's lending of misguided consumers. <laughs> misguided lending for, for consu from consumers to banks and the process losing money. So if there was a, a, a way to optimize that, which there is obviously, but if that, that particular optimization was available to everybody by default in the digital wallet, so how, how much money do you expect would people lend to commercial banks. None. So so now we're adding this up. So uh, the, the revenue that banks make today from, from payments about 30% of, mm -hmm. of their revenue, right? So they, they have a few, few billion dollars usually from consumer that lend money to them and then they have about uh, just under shy of a billion dollars in, in M1. So we're gonna, 
my expectation is that's all gonna go away <laughs> in very short order, right? And um, yeah, unfortunately, the problem still to today are those online offerings. And this a CBDC would, would go a very long way, albeit if it truly will take another three to five years, it seems way more likely that some smaller nation that is um, pegging his own its own currency to, to the US dollar, um, kind of by accident, is gonna roll out a peer-to-peer -peer cash in my opinion. But let me ask you something. Let yeah. me ask you something really, really quick. Sure. Because aren't we? Does, didn't, doesn't this create somewhat of a paradox? We have the CBDC that's issued by, you know, the central bank. We want to get away from the M1 deposit. To them, will mm -hmm. they? Will this be possible? Will we be able to, you know, interact with the CBDCs on a on a technical level? Won't they just close source it? Yeah, and so that was a topic I actually wanted to bring up. Perfect softball here. Yeah? <laughs> um, so remember, money lives off network effects. Mm -hmm. right? So it's it's like th this would become the VPN to the World Wide Web or Internet. Sure, but we'll, we'll just least co cost around it, right? We'll right. Do cost routing around it and. Uh, this is already being done right now. In in my opinion, uh, there's little you could do about that because it would require such an amount of coordination. Right? So there's at least a dozen countries who pack their own currency to the US dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. So my expectation is, if you if you look at it from a friction perspective, um, the US dollar being already sixty percent of all money in circulation. So once you have something that's the equivalent of digital cash denominated in US dollar and it's issued uh, by uh, some nation state, doesn't really matter which one this is, to be honest, uh, people will trust it enough because remember, um, if there's no, no need for M0 and M1, do, do you care what state it issues? People don't care, um, as we noticed, from our short history in, in the stablecoin space, uh, that there was some rumors about Tether not being actually fully backed. Because the reason why I don't care is because it's just an instant exchange usually. It's like the, the exposure, the risk exposure that you have is very, very little. Right. It's not you to crumble for the 10 minutes it, that you're using it. It's, yeah, it's, it's seconds, right? You don't actually hold on to it, which comes down to the remaining function of fiat is simply that of unit of account. It's, mm -hmm. it's really just the label that you like to see. And we just uh, attach some legacy technology called databases usually um, to that. But once we remove that, well, there go all your limitations with that because you don't store much value in, in, in fiat at all. Right? You, you wouldn't want to, it's not a good idea. So if you don't have to at all for more than a nanosecond, if you're only using it for payment and only for a nanosecond, so it becomes more or less irrelevant. And yeah. what would happen if someone was to then trying to inflate a particular currency? Well, you will immediately least cost, uh, least cost around that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I mean, in essence, that's what we're always seeing the whole DeFi space. At the, at the moment, it's still at this kind of MMOPG space. Like, uh, uh, <laughs> there's still a multi-massive online player games. So uh, yeah. <laughs> have, have now turned on uh, turned to that same label, but I've been using this. That's a good one. <laughs> because uh, it's fine. I mean, I, I think that's a good thing. I think we should have done this with all financial systems to start with. It's like, as children, we play and learn. Uh, that's what we do, right? And but for some reason, we have, haven't done this with important topics like our financial system. We should have done the same thing. And that's kind of what's happening right now. And yeah. so eventually, um, at scale, once we, we can extend uh, the privilege of using these tools to everybody in the world by default, specifically those who aren't actually included in our financial systems at all today, 1.7 billion, by the way, then just like the goat herder in sub say in Africa who never had a rotary phone and now has a smartphone will will have a bank on his phone and 
would be very surprised when he first encounters a bank what they are good for so like a physical bank just like i don't expect that any 10 year old um that's around today will will ever see much need to go into a bank right i mean right. they might have still some form of limited functions but um the, the, the example I, I typically make for that is so how, how many dispatchers do you need once you have one Uber app, right? right. And so we'll, we'll probably have a lot of like apps that, and you can already see those if you're paying attention, right? So you can already see where they facilitate what banks do today at scale for a fraction of, of what the banks are introducing in terms of fees and time delays and so forth. So, yeah, and without the administrative burden. Yeah. So, but but now we're, we're we're kind of going more towards like uh, the, the big picture. So maybe to to pull this back to the CBDC. So that that's um, really missing from from those discussions, unfortunately. Right. So if you don't consider this, I don't really see how you can build a viable thing because um, we are just simply running our due diligence process um, across those implementations and right now none of these proposals uh, are viable or well I'm reluctant to call them not even worth discussing because I want to discuss with them right I, I want to uh, make sure that people who are working on this um, actually expand their horizons and and get the right tools at the disposals to realize this is the current technologies and also like um, where are we in in, in the state of um, value transfer systems today, and yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure that we have the right mix of people that are working on this yet. Right, and it's still early, right? I mean, we're talking about something that was introduced just a few years ago, um, uh, well, at least in a functional way, right? Actually, no, and uh, so Deutsche Bank, for example, already had well. David David Chum called some digital bear instrument. I disagree with uh, with that characterization to some degree, but I I, I wouldn't want to argue technology with David. But um, they uh, they were already using DigiCash. You probably have heard that term before since you did. I have. Yeah. Deutsche Bank was using DigiCash in in their bank office in 1999. So that's over wow. 20 years ago. They, they stopped it, but I mean this is very close to. Um, what people are talking about today, right? But that, that was 20 years ago and they started. Yeah. Uh, it comes, again, it comes down to um, like a misaligned incentive system yet again, right? If, 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 if your business is to make money out of this inefficiencies by fees and fines and, uh, and other things, just simply being able to hold on that money, like I forgot what the actual number of float is, but the f actual number of float at any given point in time. So the, the money that I send you that uh, that is not in your account is not in my account. So that's the float in simple terms. Right? Yeah, it's a staggering it's, figure. I'm, I'm sure it is a large figure. So, but um, so that float is is used right by by the intermediaries, and uh, it's it's pr uh, it's pretty profitable, you know. So. Again, it's it's a misaligned incentive system. I, I don't have the incentive to disrupt myself, so that's why to expect help from that angle is probably misguided. I mean, it's, it's more likely, yet again, that um, private industry will develop something and then it seeps over at some point in time. You you can't uninvent it anymore, right? So, yeah. It's like you're done. So like what once. Once there's one phone carrier who offers all you can eat phone services for fifty dollars a month, well, unless the other phone carriers uh, will join that program, uh, they probably won't have many customers that want want to pay by the minute, right? It's the same, very much the same with with money, and should have gone by the wayside um, twenty years ago, really. It's uh, it's crazy how how long these things take to you know come into play even blockchain you know they there are early discussions about it back dating back to like the 70s right at least concepts relating to what ended up becoming blockchain and cryptocurrency and things like that and, mm -hmm. and now we're just only seeing even basic implementations now <laughs> year you know decades later and it's still uh, as you say incredibly friction heavy 
So, yeah. And, and, and that's something I honestly still need to spend more time on. Um, so the, ch there is a reasonable chance that blockchains won't be the right technology for this, right? Uh, we talked yeah. a little bit earlier, chances are all of these solutions have to be DAGs, right? And um, mostly though, b because of the implication it has for PID, for personal identifiable data and also jurisdictions because even, and that's a topic for another day, a larger topic than CBDCs altogether, but it's interwoven and also not much discussed, unfortunately, in, in uh, those papers outside of the, this idea of privacy. It's, it's much more than privacy. Privacy is, <laughs> is mostly not interesting to people. They hear it and their eyes glare over it. So you need to put this into actual like rights terms. What, what I mean by that is, um, so if and when you actually have something resembling SSI, so for an identity, which is also kind of a funny term, but um, then you can actually facilitate peer-to-peer -peer value transfer. So obviously, as long as you still have some entity involved that needs to do KYC on you, uh, then then you voided the entire idea of peer-to-peer -peer transfer. Right. Yeah, it all, it all goes back to $100 you gave me in the beginning. Yes. I didn't know your name, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. And so uh, you need to, in essence, solve both. And that's, again, it's, it's sort of a call to action, like um, here, and I'm curating an event right now for standards organization where I'm sharing, uh, not, I'm not sharing, but I'm part of the board that consults on the technology implementation. Oh, cool. We want to talk. Uh, we want to bring the experts in that space to, and by, by space, I mean like the intersection of what I call identity, blockchain, and their particular travel. Because in mm -hmm. my opinion, it's probably the more, most likely um, industry where a standard that will uh, stick and be over, overarchingly used um, be in, uh, will be created, right? And again, this is like turning this back to CBDCs. CBDCs need that too, right? Um, you need to have a solid solution that addresses personal identifiable data in right. order for actually to, to create peer-to-peer -peer cash. Unless and if, which is totally fine by me, unless and if you really just create a peer-to-peer -peer bearer instrument and uh, there's, there's no need for anything else. But he, he, the point there being is, remember we talked about all these other forms of money out there, right? So how they were being created, for what reason? So uh, there is obviously points in time where, where you need that, as in, uh, yeah, you need to know who, who owns that house, for example, right? And so that's yeah. the terms and the larger point there being as that most assets or more correctly, most rights that you're transferring, um, you're transferring to a person who then gets to take uh, ownership over it, which is, um, a very important distinction to make and see, doesn't seem to be understood by some of the authors of the paper. So if, if, you, if I give you um, a paper note right now, do you own the paper note? If, if you, like the $10 yeah. I give you, do, you, do you own it? You gave, yeah, I mean, it, it's in my hand, right? <laughs> but you don't own it. Would it surprise you that you don't own it? How do you, how do you mean? Well, you possess it, yes, and you mm -hmm. get you get limited usage rights to it. Mm -hmm. If you destroy it, you could go to prison. This is property of the Federal Reserve. I see. I see where you're going with that. You don't get to sure. own it. <laughs> you get to possess <laughs> it and use it in a particular way. Actually, if you do anything to that particular instrument that um, makes it so that it can be used for its intended purpose, it's a found. You can go to prison for six months, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can't actually own it because, yeah, if I buy a coconut from you I, and I give you the five bucks and you give me the coconut, I can do whatever I want. The, the coconut uh, is my property. I can destroy it. I can smash it. I can eat it. But you, in return, you just got limited usage rights to that particular instrument. And again, the, all of these instruments that you, you would be getting right now they come with with a history. They also 
come with obligations, like I just mentioned, that are particular to certain jurisdictions and so forth, right? You have yeah. capital controls, you can move certain things and so forth. So it comes back to, well, if, if you're actually introducing digital bearer instruments, which is part of, a, of every paper's discussion is like, how do you quote unquote for enforce EML rules and things of that nature? Which right. comes down to my earlier point, that's the hammer analogy. It's like, I'm, it's like I'm buying the hammer, just assume I'm gonna put a nail in the wall with it. I'm not gonna hit someone in the head, but why are you doing this? It's the wrong entry point. So the, the problem here is that needs to be identified and discussed in more, more detail. The original implementation of money and the way we are creating it and the way we are controlling it has been problematic. Let's call it this way. It has been very problematic. And so if you're trying to keep the, these particular limitations with that new instrument, I don't think it's going to be viable because there is going to be something that is actually going to be peer-to-peer -peer cash. And uh, it, it seems unlikely at this point in time that this is going to be intentionally be created by a, a nation say, I, I very much expect this to be unintentional, kind of like the Berlin Wall came down. <laughs> unintentional. Yeah. Yeah, I can't, see, uh, I can't see a government intentionally creating something that can't be tracked, you know? Um, although cash is to some extent that way, we've, we've, as you said yourself, you know, most of it is debit cards now uh, yeah. or credit cards and some of it's cash and so for some reason checks, but credit and debit are easily tracked. So, but for situations in which provenance is important, like you said, it makes sense. Buying house, art, things like that, where you want to know that it came from the person yeah, and belongs so, to the person. Yeah, so that comes down to like, so every, every money is a contract, remember? Every piece mm -hmm. of money is a contract. So um, all of these other things are also obviously contracts. At the end of the day, we're, we're talking about legal technology, right? And so all of these other instruments like mortgage and of course they're all contracts. They might be de denominated in the using a particular unit of account. So I like to think of all of these particular contracts and the way they're being created kind of as metadata. So you, you have an entry in, in your account log and it says 500,000 and um, depending on what side of the ledger it is, it's either an obligation or it's, it's an, an asset of value of, of yours, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in my mind, that's obviously what we want to see in a way, right? So if you have your, your personal wallet, you, you want to be um, able to custody all of your assets in that wallet, right? Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, right, you, you need to consider all those other different things, quote unquote, right? It's mostly uh, that are using this unit of account. Whereas at the end of the day, um, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have any unit of accounts anymore anywhere. As in, it's just numbers, right? Which they already are, obviously, and we're just using it for understanding. But it, this mm -hmm. comes down to, if we all spoke one language around the world, it would go a long way, obviously, for understanding each other. The same old stupid value. And so at that point in time, if, if you see a number here on a banana, right, you assume it's US dollar, uh, even if it doesn't have the US dollar sign attached to that, right? In another country, you have a different expectation. Um, but uh, how many voice of IP protocols do we have, right? But we have one, that's why we can talk right now. Right. Uh, and, and so the value transfers is mostly a human commercial coordination problem, right? That's why I'm working on this like thesis paper, like the, which I call commercial coordination theory. As in, so the, the point there being is that you, you want to use the byte level to to coordinate um, atoms, the physical level, right? And so that's what DAX and decentralized software solutions are ideally suited to do. <laughs> it's a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to read that because it can go so deep, oh. <laughs> much like this conversation has. Oh. Um, and you've been so generous with your time. I know that we, we're, we're coming close to, to the hour here um, and I don't want to take up all of it. Is there anything we missed? I feel like we've talked about so much. No, I, I think because I, I mean, I tend to 
go down deep rabbit holes because unfortunately there's, uh, in my opinion, not, not a whole lot out there. Um, what I'm doing right now is kind of summarizing um, the VC method to look into the viability of technology, right? And then mm -hmm. apply this very specifically, which you already obviously have been doing to all the legal fund projects, but then write it in a way that's easier, understandable. I'm going to share this for, for peer review and then I'm going to share it with um, those teams that are working on those CBDCs for their contemplation and consideration. Because right now, uh, and I really haven't done this at, at scale. I didn't really have the time to, to do this. I just did it exemplary. But right, right now, anecdotally, I, th I think none of these concepts that they're introducing are viable. So what I mean by that is that they're just, then just not addressing the, the bigger picture, right? So in, in that right. sense, to, to miss the mark is almost inevitable, right? If mm -hmm. you don't address, let's call it all the money, what, what's the point in addressing like s some subset of that? And then, because you know the old adage of Gresham's law, right? Which is kind of funny that, that they assigned to Gresham because that's a law that actually predates Christ. <laughs> um, which is simply that bad money drives good money out of circulation, right? So if you have something mm -hmm. that's better money, i.e. it was usually the, the analogy and metaphor was being made for like gold, gold coins and stuff, right? It's like, uh, I'll keep the gold coin, I'll give you that paper that, <laughs> that gives you the right to the gold coin, but I'm going to hold on to the gold coin, so to speak, right? Yeah. So, the, so the point there being though, is like if, if you, look at the M M0, M1. So yeah, you, you don't want to hold on to that. It's inflation, right? So if you can move it easily into something else, specifically something that pays you, and um, if there's nothing you need to do to, other than download this particular software that just makes it so, yeah, you, 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 then you would just, just do it. Now the, the, top, the, the topic and task for, for the next couple of years, which is, something I've been asking for for three years is so just focus on making that possible. It's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and there's too few teams working on that. Everybody's kind of working on this meta level in this big MMOPG. Again, I think that's a good thing, but uh, at the same point in time, the real value is always being created in the on and off ramp, right? It comes back to the thing that I keep leaving everybody with. It's like, um, use like end users never adopted voice of IP. Yeah. They adopted Skype, they adopted WhatsApp. You ask them if they adopted voice of IP, or you get blank stare from them. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Obviously, right? So, that, yeah. so that's why that's why if you ask your mom about Ave or Dai or something, she's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. Mom, you should be using Dai. <laughs> <It's getting laughs> Mom is like, yeah, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> right? So, mm -hmm. so the, again, they're like creating new units of account. It's like creating a new language. And as a person trying to get your product to market, that's probably the worst thing you can do, introducing new language that people need to learn in order to use your products, right? Right. Yeah, better to make the current languages more understandable, right? Um, no, the people have their current language. D don't even try. Mm -hmm. your, your job as a technologist is, is not to ask users to adapt your technology. It's your job to adapt your technology to the user to the user the best, that's great advice yeah uh, and yeah that's why i still after five years still get emails cryptocurrency adoption bitcoin adoption <laughs> blockchain <laughs> adoption like no <laughs> no that, that is just a, that is just something very naive and very silly to say these things right mm. it's like there, there is no such thing. Your job is to adapt your technology so the user doesn't have to learn your new language. Right? The best technology is those that you don't understand, don't perceive, don't have to understand, don't perceive. Right? You, you flip the switch, the light comes on. Um, there's probably right. not too many people who, who would know how 
uh, incandescent light bulbs are being manufactured and wires are being installed and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> and neither they, should, they don't care and they shouldn't care, right? And in my opinion, that, that should particularly hold true for a thing that you use on a daily basis to um, purchase your, your daily needs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're specifically in, in money in general. Yeah, we've said it for a long time, you know, once, once this technology exists in the background, uh, we'll stop talking about mass adoption and all, all of those, as you say, silly things. Yeah, so number of cryptocurrencies we need is somewhere between zero and one. And that one is Divi, right? <laughs> the one is Divi. <laughs> um, well, Christian, I, I can't thank you enough for joining me uh, today on the D Divi Crypto Podcast. Um, as always, for the listeners or viewers in this case, you can find all of the information about Sustiny Capital, Christian Kamer on our show notes on the blog or in the description of the video. Christian, you have anything you want to sign off with before we end? No, I'm, I'm still looking for intelligent people to join uh, our discussion and event on the topic of addressing identity. And I, I usually use, use his air quotes. I'm trying to lose those. Um, but Really, from a legal perspective, we're talking about agency here. So it's, okay. it's the, the control of your, not only your data, uh, most importantly of your uh, attention. And so that, sure. that's going to be a much larger topic for a later date. But yeah, um, uh, I looked at a couple, of, not a couple of hundred, but probably like 150, some, some project in that space that use that term identity. So I'm very interested in identity related solutions those are the bottleneck right and mm -hmm. they're the bottleneck to cbdc's but they're the bottleneck to any type of value transfer and it's a very very dangerous um point in time in technology history that we're reaching here because if we get this wrong it's going to have really dire consequences so if we don't have the technology that serves us but that will serve let's call it the state. I mean, the state isn't the real thing, but that, that doesn't actually put us into the driver's seat. That's kind of where we are right now. And that's where we're heading ever much more. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, in simple terms, uh, the battle cry here is we need to stop companies that offer social engineering as a service and reverse that model, right? So that, that they can be of service to the individual. Like that. So, the call to action is if, if you're developing something in that space and the, could be the underlying um, protocols, if you will, layer zero protocols, the DAX, um, but then also if you have a understanding of legal technology, um, yeah, reach out to me. There you have it. And, and by now, if you've listened to the entire pro podcast, you should know exactly how to set up your pitch deck and your white paper to reach out to, uh, to Christian. Make sure you do that. Um, once again, Christian Kamer, thank you so much for coming on. For the viewers and listeners, I will see you next time.